haven't read it yet. Right. This is complicated. Good morning, everybody. We'll call the meeting to order here. And a um, couple of items before I have Curtis do his report. Um, there is one correction on agenda item six in the first paragraph. If you're looking, um, the amended contract uh, amount for HEA is 7.4 million, not 6 million. And that'll be explained when we get to that agenda item. Um, on the agenda item regarding the concession leases, you know, we've switched around uh, the process for public comment at putting the public comment early in the meeting. We'll continue to do that except for the uh, concession item because I know there are a number of people who uh, will or may want to speak and the, so we'll, we'll separate those two comment periods and we'll have the public comment on the concessions after the pre presentation is made. We'll have the other public comment that doesn't relate to concession items in the ordinary <laughs> course right after uh, the executive director's report, I think is what, what we've got it scheduled, just so you know. Um, it is casual. You see us uh, sitting around up here. August is the casual meeting uh, dress code for uh, the commission. And uh, I remember the first time I showed up for one of those meetings, I didn't get the word, I guess, and I wore my suit with a tie and didn't really get to enjoy the true casual nature of August in Oregon, which, you know, we've had some great weather, a little bit hot for some people, but nonetheless, great. We'll be back to rain soon. So we'll put our suits back on when it starts to rain again. Uh, so we need a motion and second for approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting of July 12th. <laughs> so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. And uh, now I'll ask Curtis for the executive director's report, which is my first one to listen to in person. So I'll look forward to that, Curtis. Well, I hope to make it very exciting for you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see you this morning. Uh, first, I'd like to um, acknowledge the safety champions that you'll see again on uh, the rotating uh, basis up here on the screens. Uh, a bunch of great port employees who've really focused on safety over the past month and are recognized with our safety champion designation. Stan, I wonder if you would help us uh, with the uh, safety message for the day. Certainly, so everyone is aware in the state that we're gonna have a solar eclipse on August uh, 21st and uh, this will, the partial eclipse will actually start a little after nine in the morning. Total eclipse uh, will be between 10.15 and 10.25, depending on the location uh, in the state. Uh, and it will last about two minutes. And there's a lot of people in the state that are focusing on this issue. Uh, it's kind of been hard to get exact numbers, but we're anticipating well over a million additional people in the state of Oregon visiting uh, during that uh, time period of a week or so, uh, specifically about two days before and two days uh, after. Um, and we're also going to see unprecedented numbers here uh, at the airport, uh, number of travelers, as well as a vast increase in rental car usage. And so I thought the message today, I would talk uh, about the solar eclipse and how to be, be prepared. First of all, from a travel standpoint, um, expect very prolonged travel times, heavy traffic throughout the entire state. Uh, they're recommending that you fuel uh, your vehicle early and actually fill up your tank uh, the, the, before the Friday, before the event, on, before the 18th. Uh, for road conditions, they are suggesting that uh, people uh, call 911, or not 911, 511, and or look at tripcheck.com. They'll have updates 24-7 uh, during that period. And let people know where you're traveling to. Um, that's really important. And if you're traveling, plan for your basic needs, uh, food, water, gas for the car, I've already mentioned. Another thing is emergency services may be delayed due to road congestion. And so they're really recommending that everyone check their first aid kits and, and make sure you have your medications with you in your car. Uh, make sure you have emergency contact information. They're suggesting uh, to get some cash ahead of time. Um, 
always, if you're going to be traveling, make sure you have a map of the area in case things do get very congested. And they're suggesting that cell phone service is going to be extremely, um, it's going to be at capacity. Uh, they're suggesting also to maybe carry an additional char charger uh, in case uh, you're out and about and you lose, um, lose power to your cell phone. As far as viewing the eclipse, uh, they're suggesting arrive early, stay put during the eclipse, and leave late afterwards. Get to your viewing spot earlier, and they're really warning people to be careful not to uh, trespass on private property. Uh, that could end up uh, causing a problem, especially where proper solar glasses. There's only four manufacturers uh, that uh, are uh, certified uh, safe, uh, that have certified safe eclipse uh, viewing glasses. And uh, do not view the eclipse uh, when you're driving. Uh, not a very good idea. <laughs> Lastly, just to communicate to the commission that our PDX team is working closely with Oregon Office of Emergency Management, Travel Oregon, and a host of other agencies to help ensure that uh, Oregonians, the visitors to our state, all have a safe, positive, and enjoyable experience while they're here. That's the message. Terrific. Today. Thank you, Stan. Yep. That's a message you'll get once every 28 years. <laughs> Correct. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I couldn't help but thinking as a parent of two small children that there's going to be a run on cheddar bunnies, and so load up on cheddar bunnies as well. <laughs> um, terrific. Um, let me uh, first move to an award that the port has received. We talk a lot about great awards for the airport and uh, for finance and for various elements of our team. But uh, over the course of the, the past month, the port received an award as the best public project owner for 20, 2017 in a survey of Daily Journal of Commerce readers. This effort surveys our peers and people and firms we work with throughout the year, and so it's especially meaningful for us. It recognizes all phases of project management, including our contracting methods, commitment to utilizing small business firms uh, with specific goals on projects. It also notes that our PMs and CMs work closely with prime and subcontractors every step of the way, and that we pay our prime contractors quickly and ensure subs are paid promptly. So uh, it's a real testament to our team, uh, Stan, uh, your team primarily, but other uh, members of the port team as well. So congratulations to everyone who um, works on projects uh, for the port. Just a great honor. As Stan noted, uh, it's going to be a, a busy week or two at the airport, but it's been a record-breaking summer anyway. We're expecting um, more than a million visitors to the state, and uh, that, I think, is going to be felt uh, first and foremost at the airport in rental cars. Uh, we're expecting over 17,000 rental cars, which is about three times our normal on that weekend. So uh, we're working closely with our partners at TSA and the re rental car agencies to make sure folks uh, are behaving safely, returning cars uh, promptly, not leaving them parked anywhere that might be unsafe, um, and doing a lot of extra outreach to passengers to make sure everyone takes a little extra time um, to get here early. Uh, also news at PDX, uh, we're adding more direct service. Uh, Alaska Airlines on August 19th will start <coughs> nonstop service to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and on August 30th, a new nonstop service to Detroit. So uh, very exciting continued growth here that uh, makes our uh, new additions in this calendar year rise from, I want to say, 11 new routes to 13 this year alone. Uh, and on the downside, we were surprised to learn uh, this week that Penn Air is suspending all service at PDX. Uh, it's actually now filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, but uh, just a year ago, you may recall, we started service to Klamath Falls and North Bank Coos Bay, really adding an element of uh, uh, local direct service uh, that we'll hopefully be able to reestablish here in the not too distant future. Um, at Hillsboro, the airport master plan is now underway. We're updating that plan uh, in hopes of preparing for the region's needs for the next 20 years. And we're doing a lot of community outreach, including the farmer's market out in Hillsboro uh, this month, and we're asking for input online for those who are unable to be at one of our events. Uh, that online interface is available on the Port of Portland website. We're also asking folks to submit any ideas and uh, feedback by the end of August, August 31st. The next planning advisory committee out at Hillsborough Airport uh, is Tuesday, September 12th. 
And finally, on the Marine side, um, another thank you to Commissioner Pierce for leading our Industry Leaders Committee. We had our second meeting uh, last week. It's been really engaging uh, to work with industry leaders around a future for T6 and is very promising. Uh, the team is really actively engaged in seeing if we can't get service restarted on both the rail and the Marine side sometime later this year. So watch this space. That, Mr. President, is my message for the month. Thank you, Curtis. Is there a motion and second to approve the executive director's report? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thanks. That motion carries. Uh, this is, as I mentioned before we got started, the time that we've now made available and will make available for public comment. I do have a note from one of the speakers who signed up for item number five, which is the concession business, who is uh, uh, working uh, today, but taking time off to give testimony here. So uh, I would ask uh, Van Touche uh, to come up and uh, speak to us uh, out of order here a bit uh, as convenience to you. So thanks for being here. If you just introduce yourself and your affiliation, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Van Tooch, and I'm a cook, and I have worked in this airport for 11 years. Yeah, I'm a refugee from Cambodia, and I need a job to support my family and myself. And at my age, it's not easy to find any other job, especially a job that have a health Healthcare. I'm concerned that the company will not hire me at the age of 63, and I don't have enough retirement saving to uh, stop working yet. And I work at good staff. Um, many of my co-workers lost their job, lost access to the healthcare when the port kicked good staff out. When good staff closed, it was stressful and answer for a worker just like Kit is now. Yeah. We look to the port to fix this situation then and I am disappointed to find myself in the same situation just a few years later. I was lucky that because of my union and I was be able to transfer to Roke. Now I am not guaranteed a place to go. Um, what happened with good stuff was not fair. I hope that the port would learn, but unfortunately, we have the same problem again. I'm worried to find another job when the rope and rose is closed. The port and the new company are not guaranteed that I have a job. Although I'm, I, am I am qualified and I have worked hard for this airport for 11 years. That's all there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tush. I, I wish that you could be here to hear the presentation because I think some of your concerns will be addressed in the presentation that's made and the plan, but I'm sure others of your friends will report back to you what they hear today. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And now, I don't think there are other uh, folks signed up for general comment other than on the uh, concession award. So we'll move to the consent items. And I would like to know if any commissioner would like a presentation on the uh, three consent items, which I will read uh, their title. The first is janitorial services contract. Second is utility service agreement. The third is personal services contract, all of which have been covered in your pre-meeting materials. Anyone like a presentation? Nope. Okay. Uh, so is there a motion and second to approve the consent items? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries, thank you. And uh, Keith Levitt, uh, first agenda item is the ground lease at Rivergate, uh, or I'm sorry, for Rivergate Associates. Good morning. Good morning. 
Uh, so this item requests approval of a ground lease of two properties uh, out in Rivergate. These are this is really our last very large parcel uh, in Rivergate, approximately totaling 60 acres. Uh, one is we've called uh, the Lombard site. The other one we've affectionately called the Bowtie uh, site. I think Joe uh, branded that one years ago. Um, this is a unique uh, opportunity. It's it's Amazon number two. Uh, the first one is the fulfillment center that you approved a few months back uh, and is actually under construction right now at Trip. Uh, that was a sale. Uh, this is a lease, and this has been long in the in the in the making. Uh, there's a lot of complexity with this site, the street torn lark. Uh, issue. Uh, we finally worked our way through that. That's a that's a threatened species. Joe will describe kind of that whole process and the mitigation for that. But what's even more unique here is that this is a lease, but it's also a participating ground lease by which the port's going to take more risk on this deal than we typically do in most of our real estate uh, transactions. Uh, we're going to participate in the building rent, uh, taking some. Uh, frankly, financial risk that we think is good calculated risk and get a higher return. And so this is a lot about the general fund and trying to build more revenue and sustainability into uh, the general fund. We do have uh, our longtime partners, again, behind this uh, particular project with Trammell Crow and Clarion. Uh, Steve Wells, Steve Sieber, and team are here. I know somewhere back there. Um, they've been we we've been at this Lombard site for the better part of ten years now, uh, starting with some earlier uh, distribution center activity, and so they've been very patient and have put a lot of work into this. And with that, I'm going to have Joe present the item. Great, thanks, Thank Keith. You. Uh, good morning. This agenda item requests approval of the lease of approximately 59 acres of property in the Rivergate Industrial District to Rivergate Five Associates LLC for development of a non-sort fulfillment center for Amazon.com. I'll describe the lease uh, premises consisting of two properties, constraints and obligations related to the street torn lark and protection under the Endangered Species Act, the tenant and subtenant, uh, the proposed use including conceptual site plans, and finally I'll present the ground lease terms for your approval. Uh, this picture shows Rivergate, um, the lease property is located on Northeast Lombard. The main property is the 51.44 acre uh, property referred to as the Lombard site. Across the street is the 7.53 acre um, property uh, referred to as the Bowties site due to its irregular shape. The Bowties property's odd shape is particularly difficult uh, to efficiently develop. If this were not um, a casual commission day, uh, both Keith and I would be wearing uh, bow ties to commemorate this marketing uh, com accomplishment. Um, the total lease premises is uh, 58.97 acres, and this is our last um, uh, large available property in Rivergate. Uh, this photo shows the lease premises in the adjacent uh, properties. T6 is in the background. Uh, Terminal 5 is just off this picture across from the South Rivergate uh, rail yard and adjacent to the Bowtie property. Uh, uh, the, the adjacent developments, Rivergate Corporate Center 1, uh, 2 is just off the picture here for Georgia Pacific, 3 is the spec development, and then and this is 4, which is the, uh, the Subaru Regional Distribution Center. All of those developments were, were, were developed by uh, Trammell Crow. The development includes 2 million square feet, and two of those buildings are LEEDS uh, certified uh, buildings. Also note that the shape of the Bowtie um, lease uh, properties is due to the future secondary T5 secondary access road. We configured this road to allow safe driveway distance um, from the main access road and to maximize the lease premises for use by Amazon. The, we, we have known um, street torn lark uh, habitat at Rivergate and PDX Airport Southwest Quad properties. These ground nesting birds uh, prefer open spaces with minimal vegetation. Uh, Southwest, or, or the street corner lark was designated as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 2013. The federal program protects the species as well as the habitat. The port and our regional and federal partners worked hard to find the mitigation and, and development solution for, uh, for this uh, threatened species. The port applied for and received an incidental take permit um, uh, under the ESA from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on June 21st of this year. The incidental take permit includes a habitat conservation plan for street torn lark protection and habitat mitigation. Construction at Rivergate 
must start outside of the street torn arc nesting um, season of April through August. We have already performed advanced mitigation on Sandy Island. It's a 30 acre former dredge uh, material placement site and long term O&M uh, will be performed under a, a, a lease to the division of Satan land on a conservation easement, excuse me. The, this property shows the location of Rivergate and Southwest Quad properties with active uh, uh, steep coronal arc nesting. This also shows the Sandy Island uh, mitigation site located 30 miles downriver, um, uh, close to uh, Kalama, Washington. The habitat conservation plan includes bird surveys, banding, monitoring that will be performed for 30 years to support successful species and habitat management. The bird monitoring is an important part component of the habitat conservation plan to understand the behavior and movement of the street torn lark uh, for species protection. The, the lessee is uh, Rivergate 5 Associates LLC, uh, comprised of Trammell Crows as the developer and Clarion Partners as the financial partner. This is an experienced development team with successful developments in Rivergate, Portland International Center, Gresham Vista, and Tripp. High profile projects include the Subaru Master Distribution Center, uh, recently opened in Gresham Vista, and the Amazon Robotics uh, Sortation uh, Fulfillment Center under construction at Trip Lots uh, 6, 7, and 8. That 73-acre sale was approved by you in, fe in February. The lessee is prepared to design and construct a large build-to-suit non-sort fulfillment center for Amazon. The non-sort fulfillment center is designed to handle larger items such as furniture, uh, big screen TVs, kayaks, and differs from the Amazon Robotics uh, Sortation Fulfillment Center being constructed at TRIP that, that will handle small packages with multiple items. The subtenant is, um, is Amazon.com with headquarters in uh, Seattle, uh, Washington. Um, the Amazon started as an online uh, book distributor in 94 and is now the leader in e-commerce and in the logistics industry and expanding its role in cloud computing and home products. As of 2017, Amazon has a U.S. distribution network of 243 uh, facilities in 94 million square feet of industrial space. And globally, Am Amazon operates uh, approximately 400 facilities in 144 million square feet of space. Amazon has experienced explosive growth with quarterly revenue exceeding 38 billion in, in Q2 of 2017. And that represented a 25% increase over the same period last year. Amazon has over 351,000 employees, a 43% annu 43 annual increase, and recently announced that it expects to create another 100,000 full-time jobs in the United States within the next 18 months. This shows the conceptual site plan for the 918,000 square foot Amazon uh, non-sort fulfillment center. It includes over 1,000 auto parking spots here and uh, 300 uh, uh, truck and trailer parking in the back of the facility as well as about 184 are on the, the, the Bowtie property. Amazon is planning to install uh, solar roof insulation to offset um, power requirements. The total investment is estimated at $80 million. The fulfillment uh, center is expected to be operational in fall of 2018. Employment levels are estimated at, at 500 initially with capacity for 1,000 employees um, at, during peak season. Amazon and Rivergate 5 Associates LLC will execute a sublease with a base term for 15 years and rights for an additional four uh, five-year extension options. So the base sublease term plus the option extensions are a total of 35 years. The sublease includes a 1.5% uh, annual rent escalation and fair market value uh, adjustments at the extension options. The port will execute a ground lease with uh, Rivergate Associates uh, LLC um, for 58.97 acres. The ground lease term is 55 years with three extension options at 10 years each. The ground lease rent is based on a percentage of the sublease rent revenue. The building rent times a participation rate of 19.37%. The bow tie yard rent times a participation rate of 38.75%. These participation rent rates were based on the value of the land with respect to the value of the improvements. The initial annual rent of the port is, is $1,068,000 paid monthly. Rent escalation and fair market value adjustments are per the sublease terms. There will, the, the lessee will construct all improvements. However, there is a port reimbursement of a portion of the bow tie right away outside of the lease premises, estimated at a not to exceed $65,000. The port will review and approve all subleases. The construction will start in September and the new fulfillment center will be operation 
uh, in, in fall of, of 2018. Court staff uh, request approval of the executive director's recommendation to lease approximately 58.97 acres of property in Rivergate Industrial District to Rivergate 5 Associates LLC. Are there any questions? So uh, if we go back one yep. slide, uh, Joe and Pete referenced this participation. I'm sorry, uh, participation. Uh, for the benefit of the port, how, how will you describe that a little bit better as to what that represents the percentage up there and sure, of what? sure. So, so um, when we negotiated the participation rate, it's really based on our value that we have of the land. So, at, at six dollars and fifty cents per square foot, that's about sixteen million dollars. So, of the the eighty million dollar uh, project value of the improvements, that roughly comes out to these particular components. And one component is the building component, which was turned out to be 19.37%. And then the, the yard component at, at 38%. And those total together is, is the annual uh, rent that we received there. Now we compared this structure to some of the other structures that we've done in the past, a, a prepaid rent where we would essentially get the value of the land up, up front. We looked at a traditional ground lease where we would just have um, rent on the, the uh, percent of the value of the property over a period of time, as well as we, we looked at sales and, and, and joint venture and ownership uh, options. We compared the rent revenue with the risk associated with all those options, and we felt that um, uh, the risks were, were manageable here, although um, certainly if after the base term of the sublease, that that building can has to be filled and it may not be filled by Amazon uh, for us to get our revenue. But those risks and, and the more upside of that structure were, were worth taking a, a, to get a, a higher financial return. Okay. Any other questions? I did have one uh, and, and it, it goes back to the, um, the environmental impact. You talked about the relocation of the street home lark mm -hmm. and it's more an education point for me you, you're relocating their habitat what's the experience of the port and sort of looking at that strategy I, I unfortunately i think of a bird i think of a homing pigeon they're coming back to where they started from right right so this is uh this is really the first uh incidental take permit for this species and we assembled um, uh, bird experts um, throughout the state as well as consulted with the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife to, to look at available um, habitat mitigation sites. Unfortunately, what they like is big open space is really not really available here close by. So the first sites we looked at were, were obviously try to find something in the Portland uh, metro area. We ended up um, looking um, outside of this area and come up with the Sandy uh, Island site, which uh, which was a dredge site which already had um, street torn lark uh, nesting present. And so we, we enhanced that, uh, that property. Um, now there still, is a, there still is a distance for, for, for those birds to, to find that location. But, but the fact that we have established a, a site that, that's, first of all, large enough, and the water actually serves as a buffer for you know, keeping predators away from their, their nesting site, that we feel really positive, as well as the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, that this is going to be a successful um, nesting site for, for the birds. I would be curious in knowing how that goes on as, as we go on in the future. We'll be monitoring, and we'll continue to monitor our properties at Rivergate, as well as Southwest Quad on an interim basis, and obviously uh, the new mitigation site at Sandy Island. We have committed under the incidental take permit to monitor that for a 30-year period, and um, all of the uh, the, the bird experts are really actually excited about looking at the monitoring data to, to better understand the, the species. I have one question. Did I see in the presentation a 1.5 escalation yes, percent? Yes, Because right. I didn't see it here. So that's every year until the um, renewal? That's the for, the, for the sublease. And then at the renewal periods, there will be a fair market value adjustment okay. um, at the extension when that's exercised. <clears throat> 1.5 seems low to me, but do you think it's fair? Um, we we uh, negotiate. That's obviously a negotiated number. Um, we, we we feel that it's 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 a fair a fair number. Um, I, I think obviously Amazon has uh, committed to 15 years. We feel that that's that's a that's a long period of time, and so we were able to work with them on that on that particular negotiation point. Okay. Hmm. Other questions? 
Okay. Is there a motion and second to approve the recommendation? Move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And, uh, nice. Good luck with the building and the bird. Uh, the next item is uh, uh, Vince. This is the concession item. Yeah. So uh, if you'd come up. Yeah. And Sean, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, I'm here with Shane Andreessen, our senior manager of the concessions development to recommend awarding contracts for our third and final round of concessions uh, redevelopment. As you know, we've had two, uh, we believe, very successful phases of this redevelopment, and this was the third one now. We'll have worked through this process, uh, replacing all e expiring leases in the PDX terminal building, uh, which encompasses almost three quarters of the, of the space. The agenda item before you includes a list of the businesses that the selection committee has recommended, which includes one new and one existing port partner, and both of them are are here today. They will design, build, and operate local and national brands that we believe will further enhance the award-winning concessions program and the passenger experience here at PDX. Throughout this redevelopment process, we took into account the needs of a broad range of stakeholders, uh, including the existing operators, new businesses that want to be here at PDX, small businesses, labor, passengers, the airlines, and of course the employees that help make PDX really the best airport in the nation. Um, since we started on this process almost four years ago, we've learned a lot about our program. I think we know the market, uh, the local market, the regional market better than we certainly ever have before. We also know the challenges that the employers face um, and also that the employees face in, in uh, operating here at PDX. And so as we've progressed really from the beginning, we've developed and implemented our workplace initiative program. And we've learned a lot um, over that time. And the intent is to really to ensure that we have a program that works for all of us, the airport, the employers, and the employees. So before we move on to the recommendations, though, I, I just wanted to recap some of the new concessions that we have brought in here um, and how they've uh, improved our airport in a number of different ways. Uh, going back to Cafe Yum, we brought them in in the very first round. They were one of the first B Corps uh, certified in Oregon, where they take into account environmental and social considerations in their decision making, um, um, as well as uh, certainly uh, earning a profit. Um, Portland Roasting, we brought them in in the second round. Um, they're a small business operator, but they, they fully fund TriMet passes for, um, for all of their employees to help with the transit costs. Um, Vino Volo was also brought in here in the second round. Uh, they do an annual three-day all-expense-paid wine retreat for 150 employees um, as part of their training program. Um, sign me up for that uh, with winemakers as a, really a learning and training experience. Um, also, uh, Tender Loving Empire, which we did a direct negotiation with just uh, a few months ago. Uh, they opened in May. They have an annual company-wide overnight retreat um, where all the employees participate, workshops, activities, team building exercise. And because they're also a record label, they hand out free concert tickets uh, year-round to all of their employees as well. Um, I want to acknowledge HMS Host, and they award, uh, negotiated the first collective bargaining agreement um, with Unite here uh, to represent their employees. They were awarded contracts in the second round uh, with Starbucks, and we've also uh, did a direct negotiation with them for Tamale Boy. A uh, lot of employees get meal allowances or free meals during their shift. Uh, our good friends here at Capers Cafe, they're a certified uh, DBE and small business operator, they give $10 uh, meal allowances to, to their employees to help attract and retain um, those. And both Bambooza, who got a contract in the first round, and Burgerville, who we did a direct negotiation with, both those companies to me are well known for the, the work that they do in the community, um, and both here inside and outside of PDX. So really my point with all of these anecdotes is that we've got a great lineup of employers here at the airport. Um, they bring a broad, dynamic culture to our airport, um, and we think it's a balanced program that can really contribute substantially to the success of PDX. So today, we're proud to bring you the recommendations we believe are consistent with that mission and the standard that we've set, and I'm going to let Shane go through the, the details um, on the specific recommendations. Good morning, Commission, and thank you. Uh, I am excited as well, not only for the fact that I'm here to award uh, three very good concepts and 
um, as I like to put uh, to say, put a bow tie on this three three phase redevelopment effort. Um, but I also uh, want to acknowledge that we've made quite a few new partnerships over this process. Um, some of which are, are in this room today, we've established and renewed partnerships with businesses that have been here. And um, we've, we've had a lot of fun along the way. It's been quite a process with a lot of uh, involvement from stakeholders throughout the port. Um, and so I'm excited that we're um, in the final phase of that redevelopment effort. Today with us today, um, our uh, SSP America, we have Pat Murray. He's the Executive Vice President for uh, SSP America. We have Scott Wilding. He's the VP of Business Development. With uh, Hopworks Urban Brewery, we have Eric Steen, the Marketing Manager, and Kurt Krasneski, the Director of Sales and Marketing. With Deschutes, we have Mike Rowan, who is the D Director of Food, Food and Beverage Operations. From uh, Genesco, or uh, uh, Johnston and Murphy, we have uh, Danny Wildson and three, uh, let's see, Pat, Eric, Mike, and Danny, I think all want to make some brief statements when we're done here today. So I first want to just talk a little bit about why the concessions program is important. Uh, Vince touched on it, um, and it's a, it's a huge piece of why we continue to win the awards that we do. It is probably one of the largest factors in why we have such a sense of place at the airport that we do. Portland Monthly Magazine actually last year this time said that the Portland International Airport is Portland's best Portland neighborhood. And I think we've done a great job over the last few years of reflecting the tastes and uh, concepts and just the variety of businesses throughout the Portland area. We really view our program as an extension of the community. We want folks to feel like they are part of Portland, part of the Pacific Northwest when they're here. We also have a street pricing philosophy that is uh, unmatched in the industry. Um, we, we mandate that all prices uh, here at the airport are the same, whether they're um, you know, at, the, at the airport here or downtown uh, street side. Um, what this has provided is business opportunities. We have a food cart program that really is an incubator for small businesses that rotate through on a six to 18 month basis. And that provides opportunities with no investment for those small businesses to come in to experience what it's like to operate here without any commitment, well, a six month commitment, but with no investment. All of this really means that we're able to continue to make our program as successful as possible. That success breeds uh, additional success in terms of airline costs and keeping those costs down low. Uh, so the additional flights will be added to this airport instead of, instead of other airports. Um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. Sorry, let me go back. <laughs> So I mentioned a little bit about uh, the opportunities that we have for the local community. We, uh, prior to engaging in any of these processes, we, and kind of systemically, we reach out to the local community to let them know about the opportunities that are here. We also talk to our existing business partners uh, to provide the information that they're all gonna need to uh, repropose for the locations they may be in or new locations that they're interested in. We have a unique philosophy here as well in the sense that um, generally, we do RFPs, but we also have the ability to direct negotiate locations. Uh, Vince mentioned a few times in the past few years where we've done that. Um, we actually may end up uh, with something similar to that as a, as a re result of this process and one of the locations that we're not going to award that was in the RFP. In terms of packaging locations, with the exception of our news and gift program and our specialty coffee program, we don't bundle packages together so that one concessionaire is required to spend a lot of money to build out a location. Uh, that levels the playing field for small businesses that are interested in being here and provides them a greater opportunity. We also don't bid our rent structure. Um, our rents are set by concept and uh, they're consistent every year. What this has resulted in is approximately 43% of our locations, 43% uh, of the 72 locations that are out there are owned and operated by small or medium-sized businesses. And we're, we're, uh, we appreciate that. 
Um, from an airport concessions disadvantage business enterprise uh, perspective, 40% of our locations are either owned and operated by a 100% ACDB owned firm or a partnership, um, which uh, SSP America with this award today has formed partnerships similar to that. Uh, the number at the bottom there, 24.35% participation, is the number that Kimberly shared last month in terms of the overall revenues that uh, are generated in our airport. What percentage of those are um, captured by ACDBE uh, le leased locations? And uh, last year we were just shy or just over $120 million in total sales, so it's, it's a big number. Um, talked a little bit about the redeve redevelopment effort, and uh, you know we've we've had a, a focus, a renewed focus, and a, an evolved focus, I would say, on the uh, employee employer relationship approach. Here, uh, we uh, started the PDX Workplace Initiative in 2015. We uh, asked for more, some information in the 2016 RFP with respect to how employers are going to treat their employees, what kinds of pay and benefits they're going to offer. And uh, following that process in this, this last RFP, really refined what information we we're looking for so that we can make better comparisons. And I would like to say that I think um, we've done a great job in kind of evolving that and, and making it much better. Overall, we've always strived to keep just a balance of local, national, and regional concepts. We will have a McDonald's, we will have Starbucks, but we also like that local touch in our program. Quickly, just going through where we've been over the last few years, uh, 2014 resulted in the locations that are here. We awarded 10 leases, mostly to small businesses through that process, and really launched us into this phase or into this effort. Phase two was in 2016, and although we had 26 locations in those in that, that RFP, we awarded 19 of them, which are shown here. I probably shouldn't be quoted on it, but I think this was the largest RFP the port's ever done. It was the entire coffee program and uh, was very successful. As a result of a few locations, some of those locations we did not award that were in the RFP last year, we uh, partnered with HMS Host and awarded them on a direct negotiation basis, the Tamale Boy location on Concourse D shown there, and also uh, Tender Loving Empire, which is a mom and, uh, or not a mom, a husband and wife team that um, opened what, will, what was their fourth location here at, at PDX and something they're very proud of. Uh, Blue Star Donuts, of course, is a location that uh, was formerly Coffee People, was actually slated for demolition. We brought uh, Blue Star Donuts in to operate this location on a temporary basis, once again, to trial what it's like to operate in an airport and hopefully have something more long-term once terminal core and terminal balancing uh, come to play. What that leads us to are phase three and the four locations that were in the most recent RFP. The three locations on the north side of the airport there, the long green boxes and the, the small blue box, they all have active leases that will expire at the end of uh, January of next year. Um, and the, the fourth location at the bottom is currently vacant. <clears throat> the goals of the RFP were really just a continued uh, look at what the successes that the programs had so far to continue to provide that sense of place that our passengers love. Uh, the customer service that our airport is known for, whether it be at the concessions program or the TSA, to refresh the locations. Uh, as you all know, passengers and, and our tastes change over time. Our leases for food and beverage especially are 10 years long. A lot changes in that time period, so we're always looking to refresh the program and keep it new and, and uh, exciting. And, uh, you know, with a preference on local and regional concepts. We've... Uh, a evolved to uh, attract quality concessionaires, not only business opportunities that are attractive to businesses, but also to the employees that are gonna be here and be the face of the airport. So we've put a, a renewed effort into equity and inclusion uh, programs and the, the workplace initiative in general. At the end of the day, our goal is to obviously grow concession revenues and rents to the port. So. If we're successful in all those things above that, I think that's the result and what we've seen so far. 
The solicitation process, as I mentioned, we do a significant outreach program um, and we do uh, meet with our existing concessionaires, the ones that are operating in the spaces today, to talk to them about the process, to make sure that any anxieties they have, um, we, we can discuss and they can understand what the process is going to look like. We open these uh, opportunities up to level the playing field and provide just some, some opportunities for everybody, not only those that are here, but ones that want to be here. For the first time, we had a lessons learned workshop. Um, we have internal ones ongoing, but we had an external one this time. We invited everybody out from the first two RFPs and talked to them about what we do well, what we don't do very well um, in terms of the RFP process, the build out process, and then just the initial startup and operation. A lot of those lessons learned that we uh, benefited from from those meetings were implemented in this last RFP. We issued the RFP itself at the end of January. We received 16 proposals for those four locations in May and during the month of June held three selection committee meetings where we discussed all the proposals. We had subject matter expert um, in terms of the quality employer plans, the ACDBE component, the financial risk, and also uh, the site visits that were performed in the, the evaluations. The six person member uh, team consisted as we have in the past of both internal and external stakeholders to two folks from outside the port with uh, unique perspectives. The categories here um, were how the proposals were ranked. I'll note, you'll note that exhibit K, which is the quality employer plan was 25% of the overall um, uh, weight here. Each of those categories scored between a zero and a 10 and then were weighted. So you can see that uh, the quality employer plan, although it was the highest at 25% of the, the overall weight, um, there is obviously 75% additional that um, could tip it one way or the other. We uh, spent a lot of time on the quality employer plan, as I mentioned. We created this form. Uh, it's eight pages long. And it goes into more specifics about the wages, benefits, uh, training, safety programs, uh, diversity and inclusion programs that operators are going to have here. Um, these uh, attachments to the uh, proposals actually become attachments to the lease. So they're commitments that each of the proposers have made. And they've all committed to using our labor pool prior to going outside of um, uh, outside the airport for employees when, when that time comes. So based on that uh, and the selection committee's recommendations, the, this is what we're, we're here to uh, award today or to make the recommendation for today. The location at the end of Concourse C, we did receive proposals for it. They did not meet the, the port's criteria for that location. So. Um, like I said, we'll look at other opportunities for that location uh, in the future, possibly uh, near term. And then the, the three up above uh, just give you an idea of where those locations are. We have some early renderings of what these spaces will look like. I'll note that during the design review process, a lot of these things change. Um, so, but the look and feel for the most part is, is how you will see it here. Hopworks on Concourse E. Johnston and Murphy on concourse uh, on concourse D as well. <clears throat> Business terms are standard as they have been over the past few RFPs, uh, seven years for retail, 10 years for food and beverage. Rent are the greater of percentage rent or the minimum annual guarantee, which was set at $80 a square foot for the first lease year. ACDBE, are partic ACDBE participation, it's a tongue twister. We had a goal of 15% for food and beverage. SSP America has committed to 20% in each of those leases with joint ventures with High Flyers LLC, which is a, a ACDBE firm out of Seattle. Johnston and Murphy unfortunately did not uh, obtain an ACDBE partner for this location, for this, for this airport, but they have committed to a best faith, good faith effort uh, with goods and services during the design and build out of the location. All the improvements in midterm refurbishment will be by the concessionaires and standard uh, business terms that follow there. <clears throat> Next steps, uh, immediately following this meeting, uh, 
uh, pending approval from you all today, we'll immediately start the design review and permitting process. We'll have employee transition meetings. We've already had uh, several meetings with the outgoing concessionaires to start that conversation. The existing concessions will close at the end of January. We are talking to uh, the incoming, uh, well, I guess it's our existing partner, but SSP America about temporary wall units that'll be in front of each of the food and beverage locations. That'll uh, allow for up to 20 to 30% of that workforce to be able to stay employed um, while they operate in front of the construction barricade during the four month window where they're actually constructing behind. We'll have a PDX job fair in the spring if needed. It's likely that we will because one of the things we hear day in and day out from our existing concessionaires is that they just can't find folks to work out here. There's a lot of jobs and uh, it's hard to, to uh, hire talent right now. That's probably gonna exist next, next year as well. Johnston and Murphy will open in May and then uh, we are also talking to SSP America about staggering the development of the two locations um, so that only one location's employees are displaced at any given time. So staff recommends uh, the executive director's recommendation for uh, these three leases here today. Okay, so <clears throat> what I think uh, makes the most sense here in terms of the process that we follow, because I know you have some of the prospective uh, tenants here that would like to comment. And what I think we'll do is the folks that have signed up to speak uh, from the public on this issue, we'll have them come up and talk to us next and then we'll have the representatives of the prospective tenants. And then we'll, in this process, have commissioners ask questions of each of those groups. So when we get to the end and we're asked to make a decision, we'll have the full benefit of folks' uh, comments. Before they make a clean getaway, I got a couple questions. <laughs> Me too. Well, I mean, I, I think we all have questions of them and we'll have questions of each of the following people who come up. Uh, my suggestion is that after we've heard from everybody, we'll bring these two folks back to question them further, and we can in the process ask questions both of the public generally and of the representatives of the uh, tenants, if that works. Or... My question has to do with the process. Okay. I, I mean, we can, uh, I, I, if you want to ask questions of these guys now, and we'll bring them back up again and ask them again, that's fine too. If that, so go for it. Thanks. Um, you said the um, how you weighted the employer plan was different in this uh, cycle than the last. Can you explain that to me a little it, bit? It was it was twenty five percent of the overall weight, which was actually the same as last time. Uh, the difference being that in the last round of uh, proposals, we asked for just broad statements about how employers were going to address these big buckets of information from pay and benefits. Um, following the last RFP, we, we created that eight page form that really lists line by line exactly what they're going to pay each position, uh, what the cost of benefits are going to be, uh, whether or not they do paid parking, how, what their safety programs are like, whether or not they're committed to using the labor pool before they hire from external sources and also where they're going to find those employees, which is, would be from, from this area. So um, the, the waiting was the same. It's just we asked for more detailed information out of this to get a true apples to apples comparison between proposals. Because last time we heard a lot of g generic and vague statements such as competitive pay and benefits. Um, we obviously lessons learned from the last RFP wanted to really refine what that meant. And that's, that's where we took it. And lastly, um, thanks for the briefing yeah. uh, a week or so ago. And we talked about um, trying to get not just that the uh, new leases would use the pool of applicants, that they would be perhaps they'd have to hire 30% or 40%. Is there any progress been made on that? Yes, uh, SSP America has committed to a good faith effort to hire up to 100% of their new employees from the labor pool. Okay. okay, thank you. They have one of the locations today, so they have a pool of employees. But okay. 
Commissioner Saruta. Yeah, Chairman, thank you. Uh, my questions just pertain to my desire to understand this presentation a little better. So probably now is the time because they are still there. Is that okay? Sure, go. Thank go you. Ahead, go ahead. Uh, in terms of uh, ACDBE, yeah. how is such an uh, entity, you know, um, enterprise defined as? That's number one question. And uh, those numbers, 15% in you know, goals, for the uh, food and the beverage, and 11% for the retail. Uh, where did they come from? How were they uh, derived you know, from? And I think you said earlier something like 40% uh, currently at the uh, overall airport location. Does that imply that uh, we've done much better than goals? Those are three questions I have. Yes. And I'll try to answer the first one. I'm not the expert, and I, I doubt the expert's in the room today. But um, She is actually in the room, so please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if I slaughter anything, uh, Kimberly. Um, oh, and, <laughs> um, in terms of uh, what, qual what uh, constitutes an ACDBE, there are uh, size components and, and uh, minority-owned uh, requirements to go into that, I don't know exactly what those set, those uh, value thresholds are, but they have to meet. Uh, they have to be basically uh, minority women owned, and also meet a certain uh, value requirement that they they can't be worth more as a company than. And I don't know that they. There's, there's a formal there's a formal process that they have to go through to be certified as an ACDBE company. And so there's a, they have to meet certain criteria and Shane's right about size of the business, ownership of the business, meeting certain criteria that are set up. So they go through a formal application process and then they get certified. Yeah. If it takes only 45 minutes, I'd love to learn. Not now though. Okay. okay. Now 15%, for example, for beverage and, uh, uh you know, uh, the food. What does that number mean exactly? The, the goals are established by looking at the pool of already uh, registered ACDBEs with the state of Oregon and setting a target that's achievable based on how many ACDBEs are actually out there. So 15% um, for food and beverage, there's a lot more ACDBE operators for food and beverage than there are retail. So that's why the difference between the, the 15 and, and the 11%. Um, in terms of the locations you mentioned, I had the 40% number up there. 40% of our locations are owned and operated by uh, lessees that either have a joint venture partnership, like SSP America is doing with these two locations, or they're 100% ACDB owned, like Bambooza or Capers, for, ex for example. They... Uh, there's two ways to get at it. You can form a partnership or a joint venture, or you can be 100% ACDBE owned yourself And if you meet those, those thresholds. So that's where the 40% comes in. 40% of our 72 locations are have an ACDBE component to them. Doing much better than the goals. Yes. Is that what it is? Yes. That's yes. how I understand Yes, it. very good. <laughs> that's all I need to yes. know. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Shane, I wanted to, to go back to um, the, the reference about Johnson and Murphy making a good service, a, a good faith effort to to reach some of the uh, contracting goals right. for ACDBE. I'm curious. I mean, they're a large concern. They do business in multiple cities. This can't be something that is new to them. Um, but if if that commitment is not a part of their RFP, are they committed to working with port staff to identify who within our market can meet those requirements? I'm uncomfortable with a good faith effort. Yeah. Yes. Translates. Well, it's it's not a metric associated with that. Following following this following award, I would like to sit down with with their architect and their contractor and Kimberly and identify those firms that are able to be part of part of that process. Um, typically, in order to count as an ACB, you have to have that relationship established at the time you submit the proposal. And uh, we leave the proposal out on the street for 90 days. Unfortunately, Johnston and Murphy didn't have, didn't find one of those partners for this market. Um, but they do have ACDB partners in other airports. Unfortunately, just just not here. So, I have a question that's a follow up to Commissioner Chamberlain's question. Sure. So you mentioned that th this time around, you um, asked folks who were making proposals to submit a lot of detailed information around the employee issues. Did you receive information that was um, responsive? Did you feel like 
folks we did. in good faith provided. We did, yes, and, and we asked for those that have collective bargaining agreements to actually attach copies of those um, rather than spell them out. Um, we saw that a lot, of the, a lot of the quality employer plans were the same. Um, some of the smaller companies actually have, have the best ones. Um, but for the most part, we did get the information out of the process that we wanted. It's much more detailed. Um, and we have, you know, exact to the penny um, details in those workplace uh, quality employer plans. Thank you. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Please, yes. Okay. So a question that I know will come up uh, and I think is on everyone's mind who sits on the commission as we heard the testimony or the uh, offered statements this morning. So I'll ask it now and then the, then the uh, representatives of the prospective tenants can also weigh in on this because I'd like to hear from them as well, horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, Mr. Touche came up and spoke this morning. He's a longtime employee here. He's a cook. He's not as old as I am, but he's older. Um, he wants some confidence that he will be able to continue to work at the airport. And I'm sure he's not alone um, in that concern. And what I'd like to know from you is our experience over these past years that we've now had this program in place, what is the fair expectation for someone in his position in terms of getting another job given whatever is available in the port? Uh, on the concession side today. And I, as I said, I would ask that question of the representatives as they come up as well. Yeah, so um, I, I guess the, the first point is, is the labor pool. Um, we're, we sat down with uh, HMS hosts uh, leadership last week to start the conversation about making sure that all the folks that are gonna be impacted by this in that location know about the labor pool, A. So, um, so stop right there and tell us again. I mean, some of us know, some of us have heard in the past. What is the labor pool and how is that reflected in the uh, information for workers here? So the, so the labor pool, uh, employees that are in good standing and sponsored by their employer can go into a pool of uh, employees that are available to uh, be hired from. Um, following six months of full-time employment, the port actually contributes $1,000 to the employer that uh, we expect 50% of that be shared with the employee. That's what the labor pool. Um, so if a person goes into the pool and gets another job and stays for six months, six months $1,000 yes. yes. is then expected to be shared between exactly. the employer and yeah. the employee. Yeah. And we've had experience of that uh, process. Uh, of the last phase, I think roughly 16 employees, um, we paid out for 16 employees uh, to the coffee locations. And we had roughly 80 employees displaced last time. A lot of them decided to take the summer off. A lot of them decided they had new opportunities and left on their own. So it's, um, I would say, maybe 25%. That, that actually went to the labor pool and, actually, and, and were retained and stayed and, were, and received that benefit. Okay. And so do we keep data to show, I, I mean, people come and go for a variety of reasons, obviously, and many of these are not really long-term positions that people hold, but for example, Mr. Tooch has been here for 11 years. Do, do we have actual data that tracks how many people that that in fact want to stay in a comparable job have the opportunity to do that yeah, yeah i believe so i don't know what exact data we have but we do um, meet with folks and we track them through the process we have the ability to with with the badging system as well to make sure that we know you know exactly where they are in each in each stage in each stage um, for example, I guess just one example is you know, Sandoval's pre-security closed. Uh, they had roughly eight employees. We met with each one of them, and only one of them wanted to stick around. The rest of them had other opportunities or decided um, they didn't want to work at the airport anymore. So we, we do have that granular data. I guess I just don't know what form in, in aggro, aggregate we have. Uh, that's fine, but giving us a general sense of what happens to people <clears throat> who are displaced and their opportunity to get another job here at the airport. Yeah. 
that badge, uh, that badged, badged post security employee is very valuable to the tenants. And so our experience and just anecdotally is that, you know, folks want to stay here, they find jobs um, and the employers here are, are wanting them. Um, and again, to expedite that process and to have the badge already, and all we got to do is change their company. Uh, that's a very valuable resource to the tenants. Yeah. Okay. Especially a, a tenant that's new and has never worked here. Mm -hmm. They have people that are trained and know the operation inside and out and can make that transition very, very easily. Okay. I, Go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry, I just had one follow-up to President Carter. And, and I know it's difficult to sort of track the coming and going of people, but of those folks who chose to go into the labor pool, how many, I mean, what percentage are placed for people who raise their hand and say, I want to remain here as an employee, and they take that affirmative step? Now that that should be data that is. And I don't, I don't have that with me today. It's something that I can definitely provide. Okay. But, I mean, anecdotally, do you think it's a very high placement? Is it a... 25% participation is one thing, but the placement rate to me is probably the metric that's more important. I think the placement rate is going to be very high. Um, do, do I have that in terms of how long folks would actually stay in that labor pool? It turns over, right? Um, and now why it turns over? Is it because they were hired? Did they choose to go someplace else? Finding out all of the reasons, but we can um, certainly look at that data. But my assumption is that that data uh, or that rate is going to be a very high if folks want to be here and work here there are jobs to be had mm -hmm. and they don't stay in the labor pool very long well, i think that would but be we'll useful information for all parties okay. Yeah, okay. because i'm here's my concern we displaced 80 workers and 16 were hired and so n not having the information on how many people were in that labor pool um, I'm uncomfortable with it. So if we can but, get that before the vote, that'd be great. I, I guess I would s just say maybe just one follow up to that because I might have had the same confusion. But the fact that it's 25 percent participating in the pool doesn't mean it's only 25 percent who have actually gone and gotten other jobs at the right. airport. It, correct? It's correct. roughly the 25 percent. Not everybody waits to have their name right. put in the pool. They so, go get a job. Yeah. Half the folks just left um, and chose not to for whatever reason. They got unemployment, worked, and just decided they didn't want to work at the airport anymore. So um, it was a much smaller percentage of folks then that actually wanted to stay, and, and then the very high percentage of them actually were hired by employers here. So if you have a desire for a job here, there's, there are jobs to be had. It really just, it's, it's hard for us to find out exactly why they chose not to be in the pool. And that wasn't my question. Okay. My, my question is... Um, how many folks were in the pool last time and how many were hired? And we know how many were hired at 16. Yeah, but I guess it's the 16. There were a lot more that were hired. There were 16 that actually made it the six months and were paid bonus. and got the Chris, bonus. Chris, why don't we, uh, Chris Arnick, he's got the data that we do have from 16, right? Okay. Uh, thanks, Stan. Hi, um, we do have the data from the participation in the 2016 RFP. So, um, you know, we were talking anecdotally about sort of the overall participation. These are the actual numbers. So we had 72 employees who were eligible, who were displaced or affected by expiring contracts in that RFP process. Many of them were coffee employees. Um, 49 of those were considered sponsored. So what that means is we met with them. Uh, we got the list of names of those employees. We enter them into the database, and then they go in to that, that pool. Um, and they are considered sponsored because we require that their employer say, yes, they're actually employed here with us, and they ver make that verification. So we had 49 go in. 36 were considered available. So the difference from 49 to 36 is the employee needs to affirmatively accept their participation in the labor pool. They get an email, they have to respond to that to activate their, their membership. And we follow up with numerous emails to those employees. So that took us down to 36. 25 of those 36 were hired. And then 17 of those met the retention requirement for six months and we paid out 17. So really what happens here is what 
and we do track each individual employee. But as Shane said, and Vin, they, what we find is just a number of employees just take the opportunity to go do something different. And that could be here at PDX. That could be elsewhere. So anecdotally, we hear that people get jobs out in PIC. They take the opportunity to get something closer to home. You know, there's a, a variety of reasons. And just one other question, I guess, I, or affirmation I have. Currently listed on our website for employment in the concession retail area is how many jobs? Well, I looked this morning. We have 99 jobs on the PDX um, jobs website. That's for food and beverage, retail, airline service providers, rental car operators. So there's that number has remained consistent over the last year um, of um, 100 plus um, jobs here at PDX. And we found that tool to be very successful for employers and employees alike. And those jobs, you know, they range from cashier to barista to line cook to managers and supervisors. And um, so we found that tool to be very helpful. Okay. So we're, I'm sure people, go ahead, Commissioner Sruda. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> let me understand this a little more uh, clearly. Uh, the, for example, the, the concept of this uh, labor pool and also the concept of uh, incentive payment for each person hired out of this labor pool. Mm -hmm. All those things are part of the initiatives taken and implemented by the port in its desire to enhance opportunities for those who want to stay here to be hired. No? Correct. Am I correct? Correct. Now, I think it sounds like the, um, at the same time, if I were the employer, I would like to look for and find the best qualified person for the position I have or positions I have available, right? So there has to be some kind of a, a balance between what the employer would like to do in terms of finding the best qualified person for the positions available. At the same time, the port in our position to make sure that we do as much as we can to enhance the opportunities for those who want to stay here, be hired here. So is the question that we are looking at, I'm asking you and you too, that we are looking at additional opportunities and areas in which we can further, I guess, enhance this opportunity. That's the bottom line questions here. Why don't How I, does that work? It, it, so the, um, the evolution of the workplace initiative was really around those two elements, and you talked to both of them. One, make sure we've created pathways for employees to uh, identify themselves as interested in work and also create a little bit of incentive so that both the employer and the employee would want to create this place where they could see each other. And then second, create a pool of available talent uh, not force the talent upon them, but a, a pool of available talent so that employers at least had an additional option. I think, you know, it's worked in a lot of ways. It is not uh, a, a fix for every situation, but uh, where employees want to be here, employers are definitely interested in the folks in the pool. And what we've seen is a lot of pickup, a lot of turn there. Yeah. So, I mean, this is Good conversation, good <clears throat> discovery of materials. You guys have done a great job of presenting here. But now I, I think it's appropriate that we hear from the people who have signed up to speak and from the representatives of the prospective tenants. And then we may ask you to come back to answer some more questions. So um, uh, first on the list here is uh, Catherine Lamb. Good morning. Well, good morning, uh, Port Director and Commissioner. Uh, my name is Catherine Lamb. I'm with Bambuza. Uh, we were one of the proposer for this latest RFP. Um, as much as we like to win, but um, we just want to show our appreciations for the opportunity to be considered. <clears throat> we learned a lot during the process, and um, we also want to thank you, Shane and Chris and Abby, for their uh, average effort. Um, they were very resource, resourceful uh, during the process. Uh, with the future growth at the airport here at PDX, um, 
I hope and I'm very confident that there will be opportunity for us um, in the future. And I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be considered. Can I ask you one question? And I, sure. I, I assume this is public information, but uh, you have added this year to your employee compensation benefits, correct? Uh, we added the health care uh, for our staff, uh, for everyone in our company. And um, that's uh, we are able to do that for 2017 for our staff. That's correct, sir. And what's the size of your, not just port presence, but overall company <clears throat> now? It varies during the season. Uh, between 75 to 90 employees for all locations. And that's, how much has that grown since you've been here at the port? Uh, that's a great question. I would say about 40%. Okay. We, have, we have added outside locations since we've been here. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, Catherine. Nice to see you. Great to see you again. So you will represent an entity such as I was talking about, like a, one of the employers here. Now, based upon the experience that you have gone through this stage and stage before, mm -hmm, and also in the context of your uh, desire to hire the most qualified, the best person for your ent enterprise, anything that the, you would uh, recommend the, the port would consider going forward that will enhance both <coughs> your ability to find the best qualified person, at the same time, you know, in our effort to enhance the opportunities for those who wish to remain and be hired. Any, any recommendations or suggestions or something from your perspective? Well, I guess it depends on um, are they looking for, uh, what are they looking for applying for the positions? I mean, if it's uh, managers, we're looking for uh, partnerships. We try to learn um, what is important to them, to their family, and what the company can afford and offer uh, because that's investing in an employee. Uh, in order to train somebody up and going, that takes a, quite a bit of investment from a company perspective. Uh, but for, a, I mean, I would say the port can help is holding job fair like they did for ours. And uh, almost every year they have job fairs and we always found it very helpful uh, because then it's, <clears throat> everyone have an opportunity to come and ask about our company to see if they want to be, uh, you know, with our company for, you know, X amount of years and months. Uh, I think that job fairs help. And I think that the... Um, Which we have already, we have that. Yes, I would set out one more, uh, would be helpful, because the port environment, I mean, the work environment is very stressful. Um, so the, we always looking for employee. Even though we have enough staff, we always put on hiring at just because of uh, the nature of it. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Stefan Moritz. Good morning. morning. Is it morning? It's morning, um, commissioners. Um, all right, let's let's get to it. Um, I have a few thoughts, both of what I heard and then also sort of looking at the overall situation here. Um, I think today the port revealed that the workplace initiative is nothing but empty rhetoric. Um, you will vote on a staff recommendation that will put good jobs in jeopardy. Um, <coughs> Wine tastings don't pay for cancer treatment. Um, a 25% retention rate or 16 workers out of 72. Um, with the rest of the folks looking at other opportunities, which for us means if the jobs are not good enough here at this airport, here at this public facilities, yeah, I'm going to look for other opportunities. That should not be the case, right? Folks are leaving this airport because jobs are not good enough. Um, for all we know, and also to be clear, I think 
to your point, Commissioner Alexander, about good faith efforts versus requirements, right? Making a good faith effort to hire workers is different than guaranteeing that you will hire workers. The same is true for DBE participation. Um, so the, the port's voluntary worker ret retention program will afford no real job security whatsoever to the cooks, dishwashers, and servers impacted by this decision. Instead of being protected by, by this public agency, they face displacement and unemployment. And, and here's, the, here's the, the truth of the matter. Um, things could be so simple if you brought your policies in line with other airports. Workers are left behind here in Portland, and we heard about this policy today because of the port's unreasonable street pricing policy, which ensures that there is not enough money available to afford workers the ability to thrive in the increasingly unaffordable city of Portland. I talked to you about our survey, right, where over half of the workers said that their rent has gone up, and on average, the rent, I think, had gone up by over $150. Those are the kinds of issues that we're dealing with, and you're putting a cap on wages by putting a cap on pricing. Um, Portland workers are left behind because you refuse to put your foot down in regards to a real worker retention policy. For example, the winning bidder, um, SSP America, guaranteed worker retention and also a labor peace, uh, labor peace at the Seattle airport for almost 500 workers. Here in Portland, they elected not to do so because you're giving them a pass. It is our belief that the port is keeping workers in poverty. You're keeping down the most vulnerable members of our airport community. And unfortunately, you're doing this from a position of privilege and power. While job security and good jobs are out of reach for low wage restaurant workers who are living paycheck to paycheck, Port of Portland employees are the beneficiaries of one of the most outrageous and unaccountable job security prog programs imaginable. Many restaurant workers at this airport can be fired for any reason without recourse. Their personal lives are thrown, thrown into turmoil by that. While the Port of Portland has alternative work schedules and outside employment policies that lack any procedures or mechanism to prevent abuse and to make sure the port is getting what it pays for. The port told us it does not track utilization of those policies. Then we were also told that there is no whistleblower policy to make sure that people can report situations where that is not taken advantage of, uh, where that, uh, where that, uh, where situations are taken advantage of. This lack of oversight and accountability creates a system that is susceptible to abuse. It's time for the Port of Portland to live up to its responsibility to treat service workers as well as you treat your own employees, to protect taxpayers and to finally implement those policies that are common sense and are used at every other airport. Thank you. But before, you before, you, before you leave, Stefan, there may be some questions. So I'm, I've asked for this before and I've never gotten it, but uh, do you have any data about how our concession workers what their wages and benefits are compared to other major airports on the West Coast? Yeah, we can provide this. And we did this survey here at the Portland Airport. Um, and we have to work through, uh, you know, be because of the summer and some some issues, you know, our research team hasn't been able to put the, uh, you know, put the document together yet. Uh, but it is very clear that the, the wages here, you know, are not looking good compared to the Seattle Airport, Oakland, San Francisco. Um, you know, some of the other airports around. Um, well, as a follow up to that, uh, in comparison to other retail uh, concession comparable positions in the Portland area, do you have that kind of data as well? I mean, as opposed to San Francisco, LA, and Seattle? Because I assume um, you I'm, find different wage levels in every city. I mean, when, when we presented you with, with a, sort of our short study a couple years ago, right, we found that in some cases the, the wage and benefits levels at this airport were lower than they were out, you know, outside the airport on the street. Um, and, and so that situation, you know, likely hasn't changed in a significant way, right? We have to, you know, obviously look at the new data and, and figure out if there's 
if there's any change but we've you know especially talking to workers we can't you know we can't see that change you know people don't feel that change in their in their daily lives other questions comments thank you thanks and now we have representatives uh, uh, here from the uh, different perspective tenants. And uh, Shane, maybe if you could introduce them, uh, each group. <coughs> you can introduce yourselves. Yeah, That'd thanks, be Mr. Good. Chairman. Thank you. Got to be careful what we let Shane do here. Shane prepped us for the meeting and left out the casual attire reference. So. <laughs> um, so um, my name is Pat Murray. I'm the executive vice president for SSP, and I'm Scott Welding. I'm the vice president of development for the West Coast. So uh, just a couple of uh, things to start out with. Um, craft brewing and craft breweries have been sort of on a tear in the food and beverage business for perhaps 25 years now. You know, throughout the country, it's it's a trend that somewhat mimics that of what you see in coffee and wine. It's very localized, very personal to people in, the, in terms of their flavor profiles and feelings about things. And, you know, near and dear to the food and beverage business, in the brewing business, Oregon and Portland in particular has been the epicenter of that. I'm sure I'm not telling anybody here anything they don't already know. Um, but how fantastic it is for us to be associated with that. Um, Deschutes Brewery in particular is something that is served around the country um, and uh, widely popular. Um, somewhat interesting when you see someone try to pronounce it and they don't know what the reference is to the river. Um, but uh, very cool for us to be associated with that. I in particular been in this uh, food and beverage hospitality aviation business now for about 13 years. Um, all of those years, PDX has been at some point at the top of that field. So thought of to be a, a great place, not only by all of the uh, polls that are written about it, whether it's the USA Today or other food magazines, et cetera, but in candor, you know, all the pundits, us, we talk about this all the time. This is our business, right? Um, I, before this job, ran a large casual dining operation based in New Orleans. And, uh, you know, we have opinions about what airports are really good. Portland's fantastic. And um, being awarded these businesses to design, build, and operate is something that's really significant to us because it's sort of a badge of honor, and we get to associate our name with um, the Portland Airport and those breweries. So really great opportunity for us. Um, maybe touching on just some of the subjects that have been kicked around and then you know, free to answer any direct questions. SSP um, is a large company. Uh, we operate here in North America in 32 uh, different airports. Um, obviously, along with that, we have the infrastructure to support all kinds of programs that uh, you might expect a good quality employer to have. <clears throat> the backbone of the business is really predicated a little bit more on the restaurant industry, perhaps, than aviation. Um, as I noted, that was you know my former uh, life. Today, we operate about 400 different restaurants around the country in all of those airports. Of those 400 that we operate, about 375 of them have a different name over the front door, meaning so we don't operate a whole lot of the same thing of anything. And about 300 of them are all local entities local to that marketplace. So the opportunity here for us is perfect. It's in our wheelhouse. It's exactly what we like to do. And, uh, you know, really look forward to the opportunity. And if you can't tell, our, you know, boiling with expectation and excitement. So. Hopefully that gives you a good overview. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of good topics that we're talking about. Maybe just you know one thing I'll feel for you and tell you. I end up in a lot of settings like this around the country. Um, talk to a lot of public boards. Worker retention is a really big topic um, in most of America. And there, there's two things that I think you, you maybe might uh, consider in your conversation. <clears throat> one of them is that worker retention is really important. But also, as an employer and as a guy who's been running restaurants now for frightfully so more than 30 years, we'll leave it at that, um, you know, <clears throat> we're in a place where wages are on the rise, unemployment is very low, and actually, in most of our businesses, sort of like what they talked about on the website, we actually can't hire enough people. So it's pretty uncommon for us to go through that. Um, there's also many cities that um, have because the airport might be controlled by the city, have a worker retention ordinance that requires you to hire somebody and maintain their employee for a certain amount of time. 
Um, that that's not uncommon. And actually for us, that's sort of a fail safe. That's why you saw in our proposal, we want to hire all the people that are there because we need the bodies to be able to operate the businesses. If you've been a grill cook for uh, a competitor of ours, great. You know, our grills look a lot like theirs. So that's a good thing for us. And you also have a badge and so on. The other thing I'll just say to you is that the process here for the labor pool is far more sophisticated than what the rest of the country and airports have. So I know, um, Commissioner, your questions were really direct about um, exactly what they're doing and the number of people. It's sort of challenging to follow every single individual over where they're going in their lives and why they're doing what they're doing. A lot of other municipalities have tried to do that. In some cases, they're having larger turnovers of employees during those phases. But um, the effort to actually sit down and meet with every single person and, you know, frankly, the, the tone of the conversation and caring and concern is you all deserve a lot of credit for that. It's, uh, it's remarkable. So um, I, I think that for the employees and probably the, the employees of the greater area, they should all be thrilled that you're having this conversation. So I'll leave it with that. But I'm happy to answer any direct questions or any other reference points to other municipalities I might help with. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, 20% joint venture with High Flyers LLC. Yep. How does that work and what does, do they bring to the table? So um, much like, and, and I apologize because... Oh, well, you, you guys are the 20%. No, they bring, they bring the 20%. So we're business partners. So uh, we form a joint venture. They provide 20% of the capital. We provide 80% of the capital. They have responsibilities within our joint venture agreement, which would have been supplied within the uh, RFP and is a document that um, Shane and, and Chris would retain um, that demonstrates what the 20% partner is responsible for and what we're responsible for in, in terms of operating the business. It's a very um, common practice throughout North American airports. That answer your question? Okay. Sure. So one of the references has been to your deal specifically in Seattle. And uh, what we heard was that you had guaranteed retention uh, or the workers that you would hire would, uh, you would fill all of your slots if possible, I assume, from existing workforce in the uh, lease that you took over. Can you give us a sense of whether what the situation sure. is in Seattle and what you've done? Sure. So, um, Mr. Chairman, um, and I'm going to try. So maybe pick apart and answer, you know, just ask me if it's not clear. Um, not just Seattle. There's a lot of cities that um, would require a couple different things. Um, work retention could be one of them. Labor peace is not uncommon either. Um, and labor peace. Uh, is a term if you're not familiar with that what that's effectively meaning is you know a company like ours we sign a labor peace agreement we supply uh, the organizing union with a list of our employees we agree not to um, participate in the process and then you, they gather cards to have a card check agreement so once you sign a labor peace agreement we're effectively going to be organized at some point and it's not uncommon for a municipality um, to require that so and and what they're doing by doing that is then uh, allowing a union to ensure that the workplace is something where conditions are going to be you know kept intact the business is slightly different in every city um and uh the contract terms in seattle san francisco los angeles san diego just might be different in our business we don't have that many entities that aren't organized so uh, i'd actually have to Go back and count and say maybe we got three or four or something like that that aren't but the rest of them all are so uh, did i answer your question well but i just was inquiring specifically as to the ag agreement terms in seattle if in fact you committed more than just a promise to hire fill all your positions with existing employees so at the replaced location um, uh, i'll try to uh, say it's a complicated question but essentially the the the, the terms of the lease are different. Um, so um, whether it's the length of term or how much we have to spend to build the place or what we charge the consumer, somewhere along the line in that uh, organized setting, we're going to pay for something that we're not paying for today. So it's going to cost us more to do that. Somewhere that's got to come out of that other business opportunity in order to do that. So um, in the Seattle opportunities, like I said, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, just to use them as reference points on the West Coast, all of those require those things. And all of those have the ability, they're generally all larger contracts. So a lot of the things the Port of Portland is priding itself on kind of work counter to what 
allows for that, frankly. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, I understand there are different deals, different places and different requirements, and there's a give and take on the negotiation of whatever the deal is, is I think what you're saying. The pride in small business ownership, um, the pride in, you know, there's components of that that are fabrics of the community that work um, directly against the notion of having a lot large group of people organized. I mean, I, that that's really the fact. And a, a lot of those issues actually might be argued by the very same person they might want both things, but they're actually working against one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Um, going back to the labor peace agreement, um, your your company will probably have half the footprint for con eventually half the footprint for concession concessions here. So you're a big piece of the workers will be working for you. Um, have you been in discussions with Unite here on peace language here in Portland? Yeah, so you know, labor peace is sort of a term that could be used differently. Again, remembering what I just said about what labor peace is. Labor peace is supplying the list of employees that we have to somebody else. Um, we have a relationship with uh, HERE here in, like I said, 29 different airports in the country. So it's a sort of a constant conversation. Um, we can't, as, as I've said to HERE, if we were told in this opportunity that we would have had to have labor peace to respond to this particular financial opportunity, we wouldn't have been able to do it. And I don't think anybody else would have been able to do it because we wouldn't have been able to make it financially work. That, that's really what it comes down to. And, um, you know, we're good restaurant operators. You know, some of that comes down to how you manage your business, what you're able to sell, how much of the onion goes in the trash and how much goes on the table. Um, but in the end, I don't think that we'd be able to make that metric work and still be able to do this. I, Commissioner, I hope I'm answering your question. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question just about the street pricing component. So, uh, do you have a sense of whether that uh, particularly affects what you can pay employees here? Just thinking about it, you have employees all over the rest of the country, and obviously different conditions apply in those different markets. So, I'm, I'm just wondering about is that a piece that you had to take significantly into account when thinking so about So, Commissioner, wages. as I answer this, I'm <laughs> contemplating other public questions I could answer that could be more sensitive, um, <laughs> maybe uh, involving my family. <laughs> the, uh, sorry. Um, you know, pricing, I think, is something that um, uh, sort of like other uh, political thoughts or religious ideas people have a passion for, right? So please take it with a, a grain of salt. We have a challenge in the country today that wages are on the rise at a rate we haven't seen since post-World War II. We actually don't have a way in aviation to keep up with that stuff on our side of the business. So it is a challenge. Um, specifically, street pricing is, is challenging. There's no other way around that. I don't want that to be misread. We understood that in responding to the opportunity. And under the current conditions, we knew exactly what we were getting involved in. And you know we're excited about that. You're welcome. I, I wanted to, um, <clears throat> I, I'm hearing a couple of things and I'm trying to see if there's any alignment. Um, I, I understand the, the kind of the moving parts around labor peace, so I'm not addressing that. I'm really looking at some type of, you mentioned that there are some places you do business where there are uh, worker retention ordinances that essentially say, we have a displaced population, we have a company coming in that's going to need manpower, uh, person power. And we want to make sure that there's there's a one-to-one -one alignment there. Mm -hmm. um, it, at some point, if the need is so extreme in terms of needing to bring skilled people into a new environment, and there is a population that has been displaced, it would seem to me that you're in violent agreement that this is something that is both needed and desired on both ends. W why can't that be at least a foundational understanding coming in? Well, first of all, I think it can be, but let, let me just note one big difference there. So currently, you know, we had maps up here of uh, where the real estate was allocated. You have lots of different operators around there. That's pretty uncommon. So in our business, when we come in, uh, 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 Stefan spoke of a little while ago, we have 500 workers in Seattle, right? So we got 19 odd restaurants we're running all over the place. Well, us putting people back and forth is really simple. When we don't have a restaurant open, there's no way for us to retain the worker, right? So, you know, in, in really simple terms, it's because the pie is broken up into a lot of different employers. 
Does that make sense or not? Okay. And in the long run, I think hiring the people is not a problem. But all these businesses take a couple of months to build, so there's some interim period there that you're trying to, you know, combat. Well, I would imagine that your discussions with the airport itself would be able to sort of look at what are the timing opportunities, how can you stage that, when are you going to be displacing people versus adopting folks? Well, maybe, Commissioner, I could say this. First of all, we're going to try to hire, if we weren't having this meeting and you weren't asking me all these questions, we were going to hire, try to hire every single person if we can get our hands on them. And uh, uh, that would be our expectation. If you're asking me that in a public forum, I'm happy to say that. The, the, the second part of the question, though, is actually a little more complex than that because it's not about just timing. We're only going to build two restaurants. It's not building 19. There, there actually isn't the ability to do what you just talked about with the dominoes to organize them that way. So somehow during the closure, there's going to be something where you don't have somebody, you don't have a place to put them. Now, when, that, when uh, what is currently Roses and Rogue Ale closes, those sales are going to be displaced. Well, even though we'll have a temporary unit there and we'll have some employees, the sales will be displaced to all of the other stores around it. Well, in, in a perfect world, you'd say one employee goes here, one goes here, one goes here. But that's a very complicated circumstance to manage through. These guys are doing an unbelievable job. They're meeting with every – I don't know of any city where they're meeting with every single employee yeah. to talk about it. So, I mean, they deserve medals of honor for this stuff. Um, so uh, I don't know if I'm getting at your question here. There's a little bit of sophistication because of the model the Port of Portland has. I do think if you were to ask me, I think everybody that wants a job is going to end up with a job. And I think that probably happened the last time, too. I know that we just went through a whole bunch of numbers, but my, my opinion is you probably got to where you wanted to go. I, even in the people we said that didn't want it or left the airport, did they really leave the airport? They just didn't tell anybody and they went to work the store down the street, I mean, down the airport corridor. That, that could have happened, too. Because, you know, they're, they're, you're reporting on Fred, Bill, Sam. These people are busy. They get, a lot of them have two jobs. You know, they're, they're, they're just, you know, them reporting it all is not, not necessarily a reality. Sorry, did I help at all? No, it, it, it did help. And, and again, I, I don't think that any of us expect that uh, you can sort of forecast the future with, with um, specificity. But you do have a body of business practice when you've come oh, into sure. markets and you've sort of looked at similar challenges. And it's either we've done a great job of this or we're going to need to get better at it. I think the industry as a whole does a great job with it. Um, I'm betting that if we pull the port staff, you know, we sort of have this uh, slogan we say in aviation, once you've come to an airport, you never leave. And that's true from the, you know, the, the people who are out on the ramp to people that are sorting bags to people at the ticket counters. You know, because it's sort of a lifestyle change for people. If you're willing to work in the food and beverage business to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to be there when people want their first coffee, that's a different lifestyle than somebody who's working in the bar at 3 o'clock in the morning and then going home. So people kind of adjust to that, and it works for them. They're, they're used to getting through security to go to work and when to time in and all, all of those components. So, Commissioner, I, I would you know just say I think today with where the world is, um, most workers in most airports that are there today – are going to have jobs in the future, not just in Portland. And in Portland, I think you're going to the nth degree to ensure that those people have opportunity. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, we've got a couple other, and I don't want to shortchange you if you'd like to make a statement here as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> but the risk is we'll ask questions, so you may not want to say anything. Yeah. But, uh, well, thank you very much. Can we have uh, um, Mr. Chairman uh, Mike Rowan from Deschutes and- uh, sure. And Eric from Hopkins yeah. come up. Yeah. You bet. Answer my question. Hey. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> which one would you, which one would you like us to start, me or Eric? Uh, either way, it's it's right, you're I'm both older, beer, I'll right? I'll take that. Nice. <laughs> yeah. um, well, again, I represent Deschutes Brewery. I'm extremely happy to be here this morning. We are uh, we've had this kind of dance with um, Shane for a few years now. I know that we've been as Deschutes Brewery. We've always kind of stayed a little bit away because mainly because we didn't have the bandwidth. But quite honestly, what the development we've seen in the airport the last few years in food and beverage. And everything we do here made this made this a really appealing, you know, situation for us. And we really wanted to join the join the party, so to speak, because you know Portland is not the the airport is not just the, the you know the gateway to Portland. It's the gateway to Oregon. 
Deschutes Brewery has been part of the Oregon landmark now for almost 30 years. Uh, we feel like there's a direct tie-in. We, we're very involved with our community, whether it's in Central Oregon or in Portland. We try to do things the right way, and we, we see that mirrored here all the time. The sustainability efforts at the airport, um, all the things you're doing on a daily basis, prove that to me. I, I fly through frequently through Portland, and quite honestly, I, I got stuck in LaGuardia last month. Oh, my God. <laughs> It is so much better to be here. If I'm going to be stuck in an airport, I want it to be Portland, Oregon. So, um, again, we are really proud. We, we believe in our culture. We believe in, uh, you know, really our partnership with SSP, we feel, is a real, really good cultural mix because we truly believe our partners are who help make us success, successful. And as, a, as an entity that is family and, and employee-owned, we're extremely happy to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, my name's Eric Steen. I'm the marketing manager for Hopworks Urban Brewery. Uh, Brandy and Christian Edinger send their regards. They weren't able to be here today. Um, so our mission as a brewery is to revolutionize and inspire the brewing industry with practices that drive quality. Um, uh, sorry, I have this statement prepared and I'm a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, time. Uh, protect the environment and prove the uh, and inspire the communities that we live in. Uh, we use organic uh, malted barley and a combination of locally sourced organic and salmon safe certified hops. Um, and we, our Southeast Portland brewery is a 20 barrel brew house that services three different pubs, two in Portland, one in Vancouver, Washington, um, and then we distribute throughout the uh, West Coast. Uh, we're a family owned and operated, the first certified B Corporation brewery in the Pacific Northwest, a triple bottom line company. Uh, we're held accountable to improve our impact on the planet and improve the way that we interact with our internal and external communities. We donate 1% of our beer, beer sales to local environmental nonprofits to focus on watershed protection, forest and bicycle safety in the Pacific Northwest. And we're intentional about reducing our water intensity through our brewing practices. We use uh, water from the beautiful Bull Run watershed. Um, we're a gold level bike friendly business and our collaboration with Patagonia recently on Long Route Ale received Brewbound's marketing initiative of the year for transcending traditional craft beer marketing while highlighting our core sustainable values through the year round use of a perennial wheatgrass in our brewing process. We're immensely grateful and couldn't be more honored um, by the opportunity presented to us today uh, to be considered representatives for sustainable business and uh, to be beer ambassadors in this city uh, uh, that we lovingly call Beervana, mm -hmm. and uh, in, yes, also my favorite airport in the entire world. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? Uh, uh, just a comment. What did you say about the LaGuardia? Uh, <laughs> five hours on Careful, the tarmac. I'm from New York City. Yeah, well, I'm from New York as well, so it was, it was not a fun day, trust me. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. My pleasure. Since since Danny's here uh, by himself, I thought I'd and I'm going to be sitting back here. I thought I'd uh, okay. introduce Danny okay. Ewald's son. He's the uh, EVP of uh, Sales and E-commerce for Genesco. Okay. Thank you, Shane. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thrilled to be here. I did get the casual dress memo, although I'm <laughs> torn between being overdressed and underdressed after seeing these gentlemen in their nice suits. Um, on behalf of Johnston and Murphy, I just want to say that we're really, I'm excited to be here and we're very excited to be part of the PDX concession lineup. Um, we've long admired it. It's a beautiful mix of local and national brands, which uh, we think makes for a great airport. I'm a particular fan of all the beer and wine, and I'm glad it's noon shortly, so that will be nice. Um, and I'd like the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our brand today. Um, after hearing about Amazon, I feel a little shorter than usual but um, earlier, but I'll, I'll share a little bit about uh, what we do for those who aren't familiar. Uh, Johnston & Murphy is an American heritage brand. We've been in existence since 1850, started in New Jersey, but we've called Nashville, Tennessee home since uh, the early 1950s. 
Um, we're known uh, specifically for premium footwear and apparel we make for men and for women. Um, and, and we um, have pretty broad reach. You know, you think about what we'll put in our store here. Um, we'll be able to go from sandals to dress shoes on the footwear side and from really a polo to a sport coat on the apparel side. And, and the idea being, obviously, that, that we'd like the opportunity to service both uh, the business and leisure customers here in Portland. And I think there's a fair amount of each. Um, an inter interesting anecdote about our brand. Uh, we've made shoes for every United States president since 1850. It's pretty neat to think that Abraham Lincoln walked the earth wearing a pair of Johnston and Murphy boots. Um, we find ourselves being quieter about that tradition these days. It's uh, um, gotten a little more controversial in recent years, but uh, regardless of your personal politics, it's a unique tradition and, and one that we're really proud of. Um, like PDX, we're, we're very, very passionate about our employees. We, we view our team as our most important asset. And um, towards that end, we're excited to meet the labor pool here um, in Portland and, and get to work on building a local team uh, representative of the Portland community. So um, I'll close my comments just by saying that, that you know, we're committed to what we hope will be a long and productive relationship with PDX and hope that the opportunity presents itself um, and, and really excited for the opportunity to, to build a beautiful store in the airport here for, for spring. So uh, with that, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions the commission might have. Any questions? Uh, I just, it, it's a street pricing policy it doesn't really affect your company, does it? Well, um, it does in the sense that, um, that that's essentially a deal breaker for us otherwise, meaning that um, we're managing a vertical brand. So, you know, we design and manufacture our own products. And so it's very important to us that wherever we do business, um, that our pricing is the same. So that's something that we actually um, dictate for our brand. I know this because uh, on uh, the new work as opposed to May seasons, you know, on the 34th Street. Yeah, shop them both. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate it. That's right. Always the same price everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Do you have retail outlets here in the Portland market? We don't currently. We have some wholesale distribution, I think, um, probably at Macy's and Nordstrom, but we do not have any retail stores in Portland today. Yeah, great. Although I need to get by Washington Square because I hear it's a tremendous center, so we need to look at that one as well. But uh, this will be our, our first uh, retail distribution um, if, if it's approved um, here in, in Oregon. Well, we appreciate your interest, and uh, we'll look forward to whatever the outcome is and if it's positive doing business with you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Sure. Okay, Shane, we're uh, back to you, I think, now, and Vince, <coughs> with whatever remaining questions we have. <coughs> it certainly stirred some interest here. So um, any further questions of <coughs> Shane or Vince this morning? I just make a comment. Um, so I have some of the same labor problems, and I won't share my woes with everybody. But uh, in trying to track and keep count of everybody and where they're at and what they're doing and and that kind of thing, so uh, I know how difficult that is. And um, yeah, good luck to you. I appreciate what you're doing on that end. And if you figure out a secret way to get that done, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with me. And I'll do the same. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think I think you have uh, done a great job of trying to address all of the concerns and all of the interests that we have, and and here in the airport. And I know we've got competing policies. We've got street pricing, which uh, is unique and creates a challenge. Uh, we have. Uh, implemented the worker initiative program we are functioning under a statewide uh, minimum wage as opposed to a local minimum wage uh, it's a unique place to do work we, we're, we have the good fortune of an increasing population of travelers which means there's a lot of business that comes through portland um, we have the challenges of of workers here who uh, work for our concession folks that they have difficult jobs because the timing is is tough. Have to be open at odd hours. We've heard different people t uh, talk about that. We've also heard people who have own companies that are here in small business, and we've uh, made an effort to continue a small business tradition, which means that there are sacrifices to be made at, at perhaps other places or different kinds of business conditions to uh, continue that. So it's not a simple 
circumstance that we find ourselves as we're at the end uh, almost of this um, uh, leasing program. Uh, and again, you know, we're now, when we do a lease, it's seven years uh, on the retail side and, and uh, 10 on the, on the food and beverage side. And that means that there is stability uh, for that period of time. Um, and appreciate uh, folks from uh, SSP trying to answer some of our questions as best they can. And obviously, uh, different locations, <coughs> different deals. Um, but with that, I think we uh, need to make a decision reflecting uh, our perspective our, as a commission on the, on the efforts that our staff has made to put new uh, tenants into these locations. So, I don't think so. Okay, I'm, I'm going to vote and have all this going on. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, unless there's further comment or questions, I think uh, we should see if we have a, a consensus on whether to move forward or not on the recommendation. So, is there a motion and second to approve the recommendation? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Okay. Uh, the motion carries, but I have committed to let you. Uh, well, I, there's, your... there's several things in here that are very troubling to me, but I'm just going to focus on the liquor issue. Um, I just, uh, I came in here and I was going to vote for this. And uh, I think within the framework that staff worked into worked within you did a great job but there's a fundamental problem with our process the fundamental problem is when you have st street pricing it's coming off the back of the worker and when i hear uh, a leasee come in and said we can't sign a peace agreement because it wouldn't pencil out that proves to me that the street pricing and the economics of this port the workers are subsidizing, and I just can't support that. I appreciate the comment. Uh, I think it is, if there is to be a change on the street pricing or the program generally, um, that there should be further discussion of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a fair consideration. But as to these three leases i think we've uh, well we have we've approved uh moving forward with those and appreciate the participation of everybody who is here and made comment thank you thank you did you want to say something further yes Commissioner just, i would also want to offer an explanation of my vote because i did come in prepared to support it and and had no doubt that it would be supported and rightfully so the, the challenge i have is that um Agreement is reached based on where the starting points are. And if there's a starting point that says what is the best practice across the country when we look at these kind of challenges, that's one thing. I think we were looking at a different set of positioning points that are fair, but I think have vendors and um, respondents to an RFP looking at a set of assumptions that guides their pricing. A, a labor accord, a peace accord, a full employment commitment may be onerous, but it's equally onerous on everyone. And the starting point for me was important. And I just think we missed an opportunity to start from a place that would have been a bit more equitable. And let me also say to our, our friends within organized labor, and then it's, it's incumbent upon you to make it work so that other people will want to do it. It's not simply enough to win and walk away at that point. There are reasons why it would be an approach in Seattle and not here. And I just think this was a missed opportunity, but I would, and, and I just make my vote so that all parties are equally uncomfortable going forward that this was not a slam dunk. So I think that, um this is this whole process has created an opportunity to revisit the overall approach that the airport takes considering 
<clears throat> employees of the concessionaires, the traveling public, the owners of small business, the owners of large businesses, and then decide where we want to place ourselves. It's not about just these three leases that are at the end of a chain, but it's about looking forward into the future and what we want to do philosophically with that mix, because it's not just one one lease, or it's not just one part of that program. It's the total program. And I think that requires at least five or six or seven different stakeholder groups that comment on what this should look like going forward. And I don't disagree in terms of everybody ought to have a little skin in the game in terms of it shouldn't be on any one group's backs going forward. Uh, but I think that's a longer discussion, and I think it's an appropriate discussion. And I think there's a consensus in the group that we get there to talk about that um, and, and, and go with whatever the, the general consensus is after a full discussion. And again, I just say, you know, and, and particularly to um, Stefan and the labor groups who come in here, I think we do hear what you say, and we do hear comments from uh, prospective tenants, what they say. Uh, and doing the right thing means having a lot of information and then making a decision across the board as to where we're headed uh, at the airport. So thanks to everybody for that. Any other comments? Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Vince, you've got one more item here as well. You got two more. Uh, the next one is a public improvement and personal services contract amendments for terminal balancing. As you know, we've uh, gone through a couple of different um, alternatives on terminal balancing. We had an old version where Alaska was going to move north. We have since revised and changed that program so that uh, Southwest will be moving to the north side. And so um, we have two contracts here, contract amendments, uh, to help uh, get us through the design uh, for the revised program. Good morning, and I'll talk quickly because I know you've been up there a long time. <laughs> Oops. Uh, as Vince said, we're here for a public improvement contract amendment with Skanska Building USA for in the amount of $151,280,000, and also a personal services contract amendment with Henneberry Eddy Architects in the amount of $7.4 million for the construction services uh, portion of the design contract. Uh, as shown here, the project is relocating or extending uh, Concourse E, 830 feet, providing six new gates and relocating southwest uh, from Concourse C to the new extension. Also um, included but not shown are improvements in the ticket lobby and to the baggage handling system. Uh, we've been at this since uh, 2014. This is the fifth time I've been up here um, with an item, so I'll just go through this very quickly. Um, project was reapproved by airlines and a commission in 2016. The amendments here are for the CA services as well as uh, the bulk of the uh, construction contract with Skanska. Construction will, um, has begun um, and will continue through the second quarter of 2020. Uh, the project does have several small business goals as shown here. Um, we've also entered uh, our Skanska and the trades have entered into a what's called the workforce partnership agreement, which um, details how uh, labor is used um, throughout and to the detail there. Uh, this is the port's version of a project labor agreement um, that we've worked very hard to get the unions to uh, sign. Uh, some renderings of the interior. Uh, this is a view from the concession node. Uh, also showing the blended hold room circulation and concession spaces and the view to the east. Um, Skanska's contract does include other enabling projects um, which are around the terminal balancing project but not necessarily a portion of. So the budget for terminal balancing you'll see later on um, the con the construction portion is less than Skanska's overall contract. So we've added things to their contract in order to facilitate delivery. Same thing with the Hanaberry Eddy contract. Um, their overall contract amount 
or terminal balancing is less than their total contract amount because of the enabling work that we included in their, in their contract through previous uh, commission items. So the terminal balancing budget and funding is as shown. Uh, one thing to note, the budget does not reflect non-capital or sunk costs that were written off um, as part of the version one through a universal amendment to the airline agreement. Um, but this is strictly for terminal balancing's portion, uh, $215 million uh, project overall. This is a view of the approach from Airport Way, kind of framing the entry with headquarters on the left and the new extension on the right. So staff requests approval of the executive director's recommendation. Questions? Questions? Comments? Is there a motion? Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> and so, Vince, you've got. I think Irene. Irene. Sorry. Irene. Come on up. Uh, so we're here to seek approval of personal services contract to HOK for the airport signage master plan with all the projects we've got going on it's time to uh, revisit our signage standards uh, so we've hired a consultant and requesting your approval for that thank you Vince good morning good morning so I'm here seeking approval to award a personal services contract to HOK in the amount of $754,762 to give you a little background, the last signage plan was created in the early 1990s. Um, throughout that time, we've expanded our terminal and our roadway. Each of those individual projects have um, installed signs that have slight inconsistent messaging in the, by way of font, typography, and even um, messaging. So trends in today's um, signage has moved forward with digital and dynamic signage. Um, that allows for flexibility operationally in terms of how we operate our airport and the roadways. Um, we're at a good time right now to do the update because there's major projects that will be influenced by the signage master plan. We'd like to influence the terminal balancing project, terminal core, and the parking and um, rental car projects. In March of 2017, we published an RFP where we received nine proposals and we interviewed four and uh, the selection committee decided on HOK architects based on their strong experience, highly qualified team, and their approach to design. So the goals of the master plan are to continue the enhancement of the PDX experience by way of creating a unified signage approach from the roadway all the way through the boarding gate door, um, to have safe and efficient movement of the passengers, um, to create universal and um, accessibility for aging pop population, be easily and economically maintained, and be compatible with the systems planned in our airport technology master plan. The delivery is to begin the project in fall of 2017 and to be com complete by the end of 2019. The RFP requested the proposers to evaluate how our passengers navigate the PDX, PDX campus. Once again, that's from the roadway all the way to the boarding gate door, and that's all of our passenger profile, so that includes our international travelers. Um, the design of a master plan that creates a safe and customer safe customer experience, and to develop guidelines on temporary signage during construction, especially since we will be going undergoing large um, areas of construction and to create signage design standards to be used as reference for future projects that allow us to have continuity and um, have consistency. So the project budget is the consultant cost of $754,762, port cost of $50,000, totaling $804,762. Staff recommends exec staff Executive Director re recommendations award a personal services contract to HOK Architects in the amount of seven hundred fifty-four thousand seven hundred sixty-two dollars. Any questions? 
Just a quick one. Any other airports that they have worked at? I mean, can you give us a sense of other recent uh, partnerships? So um, HOK in particular, they're renowned nationally for being an architecture company for airports. Um, They just recently underwent a signage master plan for Salt Lakes Airport. So that was one of their... um, uh, samples that they provided us and one of the reasons why we selected them was that the master plan that they provided for Salt Lake was very um, clear and organized and it was um, apparent that you could see what their design intent was um, and that gave us some reinforcement that as the port that represents the signage we understand what were the reasons why um, the decisions were being made because sometimes you can get a master plan that just says here's the master plan where you put you know a building goes here a building goes here but you never know really why and HOK's um, uh, what they published for Salt Lake was um, a really good representation of what we would like to see as represent representatives of PDX. Great thank you. Thanks. Sir motion and second to approve the recommendation. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stan. Yep. Come on up, Alan. Getting the right of way to Irene there. So this agenda item, uh, we're seeking approval to award three personal services contract for our on-call architectural services. Uh, the port, we secure personal services through a variety of different arrangements, uh, including on-call s- contracting. Under, under the on-call uh, services contract, service providers are issued task orders on an as-needed basis. And because there is a potential that uh, these contracts could exceed uh, the $500,000 limit, we bring those to the commission um, for your approval. And so here today, Alan Dekesian is with me, and Alan's going to present the item. Okay. Thank you, Stan. Good, Good morning. late morning, everybody. As uh, Stan mentioned, I'm here to request your approval to award three on-call architectural services contracts. You see the firms named here. We're very excited that all three are certified in Oregon as small businesses or MWESB firms. All three of them, incidentally, are on our current on-call architectural program that ran from 2014 up until today. This slide gives you an idea of the spectrum or the range, the array of services that we can typically acquire through this on-call architectural program. It's quite extensive and it's a critical part of what we do in the engineering department. The terms of the contract are very standard for uh, services as required or an on-call format. Three-year term, $150,000 per task order with limits on amendments and uh, no maximum dollar cap though and that ties to uh, Stan's note that this could potentially run over five hundred thousand dollars for any one firm in any one year to give you a little bit of uh, history this last cycle we went from 2014 through 2017 we had four firms in the on-call architectural program and bottom line on the bottom right corner there, you see we have a aggregate small business participation of about 37%, which we feel really good about. Uh, we can't really report to you budget or funding sources because these contracts go in place in advance of specific scopes of work, uh, which then get funded and, and potentially brought to you uh, in the future. Uh, A little bit of background on the selection process, Uh, pretty standard RFP uh, within port guidelines. We had four port employees on the uh, selection committee. We looked at everything from qualifications, the team members, and so forth. The top three firms were selected, and we negotiated with them on fees, so we have labor rates as part of their contracts. So in summary, the staff would like to recommend that the executive director's recommendation to approve these contracts, uh, get your approval. Thanks. Any questions? I have one question for my own education. Who does monitor the contracts and the overages if they should go over? Whose responsibility is that? So the, um, if I want to make sure I understand your question, if they go over, do you mean over the $500,000 amount? So any, um, 
individual task order cannot go over 500,000. There's a task order limit of 150,000, and we have processes in place, obviously, through procurement to monitor all of that. Uh, at the point in time in a given year when a consultant may have over $500,000 in business, I'm going to ask Stan to answer that question. Well, as we said, there is no restriction. Once you approve this, we operate under task orders up to 150000 In this case, if you go back a slide, you'll see what the total amounts were over the three years. But there, that limit of 500000 isn't something necessarily we, we track. But what you do get in the executive director's report every month at the end of it is you get a full listing of all of the – uh, uh, awards that we've made uh, within the port, which includes the awards that we would award under our on-call services contracts, whether they be our architectural services or on-call civil services or uh, on-call construction services. So that's where you would see each one of those awards. And I but think there I is clear. no maximum limit. Oh, okay. So... Uh, I think I confused the, the situation. I misspoke. Okay. I said we would be back for approval, and that's not the case. Uh, we're asking for your approval now in anticipation that a firm may be awarded over 500000 in a year. Uh, incidentally, that only happened uh, for one firm in one of the years in the previous cycle. We had four firms for three years. ZGF was, over, was awarded over 500000 in one of those years, just to give you some perspective. Right, and the average per year per contractor was about 271,000. So it, that, that's just to give you a little bit of comfort, but I wondered if you were curious about the 20% overage and who monitors that. In other words, you could go to 150 with a 20% over. Because it does seem like, at least the way it was worded, it seems like it can just mm -hmm. keep going over. Right, our contracts and procurement group um, sees every one of these task order requisitions as well as every amendment. And so the contracts and procurement group, as well as other folks in engineering, uh, my manager, Ken Wilhite, who's here, and the engineering director and Stan, they all have visibility into these task orders and amendments. Okay. To motion uh, and second for approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Thanks. Thank very much. Yep. And I think we're done. So we'll adjourn the meeting. Like that. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> and we got done before.